morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly research morning call. Um, for today, we have a few stock counter updates, including technical analysis before um, the usual Singapore weekly. So without further ado, let me start off with um, LHN. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a summary of the poems webinar that we had with LHN last week. We have a buy rating on the counter with a target price of 54 cents. To recap, LHS has, LHN has three main business segments, space optimization, facilities management, and logistics services. We like the counter mainly for um, the Kaliu co-living properties under residential properties and the work plus store outlets under industrial properties. Both are under the space optimization segment. And the third investment merit would be the car park management under the facilities management business segment. To refresh everyone's memory on uh, what exactly is this uh, space optimization? So it involves the in-house redesigning and planning before renovating and refurbishing these um, unutilized spaces. This is to increase the net letable space and minimize the unusable space so as to increase the potential rental yield per square foot. So an example would be this um, in the pictures on your bottom right. You can see this space that they converted from an old site of a secondary school to currently it houses their headquarters, some cafes, um, kindergartens, and so on. So you can also see that they increased the net letable area uh, from 115,000 square feet to 130,000 square feet. And for this specific uh, example, how they did it was because, you know, for schools, they had the corridors, which they thought were um, unutilized. So they pushed out the walls to increase the space that could be um, usable. So this is an example of a commercial property. If we move on to the next slide, You could um, see the pictures on the left for an example of how they converted the old Amber Hotel to the current um, residential properties, pr residential property, which is under the Kaliu um, co-living space. So for Kaliu, they are seeing full occupancy at this co-living spaces, and um, some reasons for some reasons for why the demand has been so high mentioned include um, firstly internal factors. So Kaliu offers um, flexibility with a minimum of seven days stay, although most are inquiring for at least a month. And if you compare this to renting a HDB or condominium unit, you need to rent for a minimum of um, three to six months. Second is the affordability of room rates of around um, 1.5 to 2.5K per month, depending on the location and room type, comparing to at least $3,000 per month for studio apartments. And these room rates involve cleaning services, electricity, Wi-Fi, so it's all in. For external factors, initially they were targeting more of the expats and the demand for this group, for both foreign expats and foreign students is still there as um, they are unable to return to their home countries due to travel restrictions. But for locals, they have been seeing increasing demand from local young professionals. So um, this could be attributed to the pandemic Firstly, um, one angle could be the delay in BTOs or private residences due to construction delays. So these um, millennials could be turning to renting a space for a longer period of time. The second angle is that there has been this trend of uh, millennials moving out and renting their own spaces, which has also become more culturally acceptable and trendier. And many of these um, young millennials, they are um, or they were studying or working overseas. And after they returned back to Singapore due to the pandemic, they realized that, oh, they would still um, want a uh, space only to themselves. So especially with the pandemic, we have to continue studying and working from home. So they need a conducive and distraction-free environment for that. Currently, there are about 800 keys for Kaliu spread across various locations. And we do expect a number of keys of projects to begin operations by FY22 to increase about 20%. And there are more properties in the pipeline, which means properties that um, LHN is assessing to acquire or renovate. And the recent acquisition includes um, 40 and 42 Amber Road, as you can see from the pictures on the left. Moving on to industrial properties, they have the Work Plus store outlets, which provide self-storage spaces. So similarly, they are also seeing full occupancy at these um, self-storage spaces. 
initially, this was more for people who had uh, basically too many belongings at home and needed an external space to store their stuff. But um, the rise in demand for work plus store outlets have also been um, due to the rising trend of e-commerce as many people started their home-based businesses during the pandemic. And as, the, um, as time passed, the businesses expanded and they realized that they needed a bigger space to store their stocks and do um, the, the work, like for example, packing of their goods before they uh, send them out, which is exactly what um, work plus store outlets provide. And um, also similarly to Kaliu, the rents involve um, electricity, including the echo and lights. So it's also all in. They currently have eight facilities island-wide with the newest one being Tootu Kalang Baru in the picture in the middle on the top, uh, which is specially designed for e-commerce business owners, micro SMEs and individuals. And what this means is that apart from the self-storage spaces, they offer photography studios to do photo shoots and also um, locations to do Instagram Live or Facebook Live for these business owners to engage their customers online. The third investment merit for us would be um, the car park management under the facilities management business segment. So in February 2021, they acquired um, 33 car parks. And for this business segment, it's uh, much more straightforward. So it's basically collecting the car park charges that people pay in um, cash. Logistics services was also mentioned during the webinar. And for this segment, um, expansion plans are on the cards for the company to continue expanding in terms of the number of container depots that they operate around the ASEAN region, and also um, possibly a wider network of transportation of chemicals. Lastly, in terms of valuation, the current um, four times PE is considered cheap if you see them as a property play, and they also enjoy recurrent income from all their business segments, whether it's space optimization, facilities management, or logistics services. And they are also not a property developer, where the earnings is lumpy, and even uh, one times P could be considered expensive. And also the dividend yield for FY20 of 4.2% is also considered um, quite competitive in that sense. Yep, so that's all for LHN. Um, I'll now be passing the time on to Weiren for technical analysis. All right, thank you, Vivian, for the update on the LHN. Um, just going go through about the SDI uh, market update. Um, first of all, we go on to the weekly chart. Uh, if you remember that um, the past sharing I have um, done the um, the SDI, I expect it to break three thousand two, but unfortunately, it did. Um, the reason was that um, the SDI, um, because of the panel formation, I thought that. Um, it, it, it can break, uh, you know, it, it's a bullish continuation pattern, but instead it had a correction down, return back to the support zone one at around uh, 3054.669 and to 3098 region, all right? And then price actually subsequently rebound, rebounded slightly, but it was considered weak. So therefore, right, uh, we think that um, that there will be upside, but uh, highly unlikely that uh, given the current macro environment, um, in the US as well, uh, it's highly unlikely that we are seeing a break above 3002 anytime uh, this coming quarter. Maybe Q4, if um, the, the macro environment settles down, then we can see that uh, there's a slight break above the resistance zone one. So um, let's move on to the daily chart on the next slide. All right, uh, which is the next slide. Um, I will be sharing on the uh, more on how 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 the the upside is going to form. So actually, right, uh, this chart is not very updated. So um, cur currently, I think SDI is on a, a little bit of the correction downside. All right. So um, if you look at it, um, prices actually um actually came down. Uh, it did not fulfill the um the morning star above the support zone one. All right, so uh, hence I think that price is either going to go down. If it's going to break support zone one, um, likely we are going to see support zone two at around two eight six six to two nine zero seven region that is being supported. All right, uh, looking diving deeper into the Ichimoku uh, indicator, the Ichimoku is showing like uh, a bit of a, a a bit of a downtrend right now. Uh, but price action says that. Uh, says that uh, we currently are trading within a tight range right now, and prices are on the lower lower boundary of the range. So, hence, um, given the price momentum right now, I think there is much more correction down to the downside. 
All right. So on the next slide, I will share about the, the banks, uh, mainly DBS, UOB, and then OCBC uh, thereafter. Okay, so DBS, um, we'll look at it. Okay, DBS, um, uh, DBS, um, the weekly chart, if you remember clearly that um, I, I, I did a, a, a LA wave count on that. So um, currently, we are, we, are re, we are resuming on the, the larger wave five correction. Uh, uh, impulse move, sorry. And then uh, if you look at uh, closer within June 2020, uh, wave one of the intermediate phase to wave two has been uh, has been uh, has been completed. And then as subsequently recently, all right, for the past few days, uh, wave three actually has been uh, targeted, completed as well. Uh, currently, I think price is trading at an all time high right now. Uh, it's around trending at uh, $31.38 uh, region. Okay, uh, price actually um, has, uh, has uh, had a cons tight consolidation around that region. So hence, I think that when there is a consolidation uh, period going on, I think that there will be a slight correction um, uh, um, going down to the downside. Uh, preferably, I think that support zone one between $27.50 and $50 to $28.59 will be a likely target um, for rebound going forward. Um, if should there be a surprise upside, I think that we are looking at a potential wave three extender wave. So it may actually go beyond to $33.31 to $35.95. But judging from today's uh, momentum wise, I think that uh, it's highly unlikely uh, we are going into a uh, uh, extended wave three. Okay, so on the next slide. Uh, Ichimoku has already shown that uh, that there, there is a there's a like a hit and show uh there's a a, a complete range uh trading no potential upside or no potential downside at the moment so daily chart is showing a very tight range but however I want to bring you to the attention of the formation of the head and shoulder uh formation all right uh although it's not complete uh the neckline uh below trade thirty dollars to twenty nine dollar fifty cents has not been broken uh but I will view it as a as a threat currently. Uh, first of all, if you look at the immediate uptrend line uh, that is plotted in red dotted line, uh, you can see that price actually has broken down uh, actually and then uh, price, the right shoulder has been form forming a rectangle type consolidation. So any upside, uh, we any potential upside, we'll see a maximum target of $31.50. And in order to invalid the head and shoulder formation, the $31.50 um, resistance line should be broken. If not, uh, then we will see a resumption of the right shoulder and then price will actually break down. And should the head and shoulder forms and breaks down, you can see that there's a one to one calculation of the head and shoulder uh, pattern. Uh, we will see that um, support zone one at $26.91 to $27.50 is actually um, uh, going to rebound. All right, and then uh, if it breaks, Deeper correction support zone two at twenty four to twenty five point three six uh, is either uh, is actually another target as well. Okay, so on the next chart, I will share our UOB. So UOB, right? Uh, you can see that clearly that resistance zone one between twenty seven dollars and the uh, and three cents to twenty seven dollars and ninety seven cents has been tested. Uh, the six the on the on the sixth time. Okay. Um, uh, you can see that Bollinger weekly Bollinger bands is very tight. And then uh price is um is resting right now at the um at the Bollinger Band. But however, if you look at the um uh, weekly price action, uh yes, resistance zone one may appear to be weakened due to multiple testing, but um but prices um are, are likely to go down to major support zone at twenty four dollars to twenty three dollar and sixty cents region. Uh, reason why is because. Um, should twenty twenty five dollars being broken down on the downside is a, a com confirmed validation of a double top formation. Okay, so uh, be careful. All right, the banks I expect the local banks I expect some further consolidation going forward, and then um, there's a higher chance and higher probability of um UOB returning back down to test the uh major support zone, same as DBS and OCBC, which later I'll share. So on the next slide. The UOB daily chart. Okay, daily chart it shows a very clear picture of how the bull trap was actually formed. Okay, so the panel failed uh, as highlighted and indicated by my chart. 
Uh, prices actually dropped below the uh, 22 days and 63 days uh, moving average. So in this case, okay, um, we are likely to see uh, price uh, trending downside. Uh, in fact, right now, uh, price actually has closed uh, below $26. So now it's trending at $25.52 in between the third, last Thursday and Friday's gap. All right. Uh, and I'll point to note that uh, in order to support just now the, the, the double top uh, scenario earlier on where I share about the UOB weekly chart, um, if price really breaks below $25 or $24.98, which is a 200-day moving average support, then we will see that um, price is likely to go down further to uh, $23 to $24.20 uh, near the support zone 1, uh, which is at, uh, is highlighted over there. All right. Uh, correction uh, is kind of like inimminent right now. So let's see how is it. But moreover, but uh, for the bullish scenario, you can see that um, back from from August until 9 September, which is last week, uh, there's a, actually a formation of a falling wedge. And if price really breaks up uh, over the next two or three periods, daily period, then we can see that upside is going to resume testing the uh, resistance zone above $26.50 to $27 region. But however, when it breaks up, I highly doubt so. All right, as I said, mentioned price action and macro environment uh, wise um, due to the US, I, I think I think that um and, and the chart momentum shows as well uh, we are not going into a, a, a very strong bullish momentum right now in this quarter. All right. So the last uh the next chart, the, my second last chart, I think, will be on the OCBC. Okay, so um uh, OCBC is likely uh is is um I would say OCBC right now is more of like a how do I say, uh, a, a, a better bullish reversal scenario, but um, do they sell down really like invalidate it at the moment? Uh, initially, I thought that uh, there'll be a rounding bottom and the uh, and, uh, inverted head and shoulder, smaller inv inverted head and shoulder um, that, that's shown recently, uh, right above, slightly above support zone two. Um, but the, the only condition is it must break the support zone one between $11.83 to $11.83. 99 cents, which is a uh, support term resistance zone one. All right. Moreover, the gap resistance zone uh, at $12.18 to $12.30 proved to be a very strong uh, selling contender as well. So um, like I said, um, OCBC is uh, the, the hope for bullish reverse uh, revival for OCBC is kind of like diminished right now after a strong selling occurs today. All right. So the next slide will be uh, Del Monte. Okay, so that one day why I'm quite uh, strong about this is um, because I think uh, based on the Monday chart, this is actually a Monday chart. I shared it on uh, our quarter three um, um, sharing on um, on our strategy and topic with, with Paul and team and my colleague as well. So why why that one day is because uh, the bullish upside actually has already broken out of the falling wedge. Uh, just that right now, uh, currently the resistance zone that uh, the highlighted is around uh, 50 cent region and is confluence with the 50% uh, Fibonacci replacement of the falling wedge uh, is currently being rejected. All right, there's uh, some profit taking and then uh, correction down. But uh, based on the, um, the the price momentum, I'm quite hopeful that it will, it will actually trend higher back up to, to target 60 cents. All right, on the next chart, which is my last chart, Okay, so sorry. Uh, my last chart. Okay, um, the last chart. I think that one day has a very selling off today. Uh, but since it completed the inverted head and shoulder, um, should price stay remain elevated above zero point three five? I think uh price is uh going to go on the upside again. Um, on the last. On the larger front, you can look at the how the um the the market actually has uh, performed okay so um the bullish candle last friday closed above support zone one gap above and then close above the 50 day moving average 
All right, so uh, with that, I, I think if you want to know more about Damonte, you can read my report, uh, stocksbnb.com, uh, which is released today. All right, so uh, without further ado, I think uh, your time issue, I think I'll pass my time to Paul uh, to share the Daily Singapore Weekly. Thank you. Paul, to you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, Next slide. Just today, we don't have that much of corporate uh, news or reports, so we, we will just spend a little bit more time on, on the macro, just to have a quick refresh on, on what's, what's happening. Um, we have just discussed whatever the are the latest data points. Uh, so in terms of for Singapore's latest data points, uh, we re received our foreign reserve numbers I think released last week. Um, so the August is a record 418 billion. Uh, on a year-on-year -year basis, it's a huge jump. It's like 30%. Uh, we'll show you a chart later. Uh, but basically what has happened is that we, we see all this liquidity coming in uh, when the pandemic hit. So uh, before that, our foreign reserves were kind of flat, but uh, since February, March, the, re the reserves have started to pile up. Um, it's hard to, to make some conclusions uh, whether this is going to be good for the equity market uh, because of the huge liquidity, but the only, uh, the only thing we can say is that it's, it's going to be positive for the Sing dollar. Uh, because th there's very little literature from MES about the impact of the reserve, so it's hard for us to come up with some, some major conclusions, but I guess in general, uh, the surging foreign reserves for us is just a, a safe, it kind of reinforces our so-called safe, safe haven status. Uh, the other data point we got was uh, construction, which remains strong. Uh, we don't look at monthly numbers because it's really volatile. It swings uh, hugely a month on month. But if you look on the year to date, that means up to July, the amount of con construction contracts awarded in value terms is up 20%. I will show you a chart later. It was just that it just re re reinforces that the recovery is still on track. Um, not much on the US data point. So we were looking at some of the electronic numbers. So uh, the semiconductor sales, global semiconductor sales or billings were out. And in July, it was still huge. It seems to be accelerating. It's up about 31% year on year uh, to 45 billion. Uh, and also um, it was even faster than a month ago, which is 26%. Uh, the other data point for electronics was uh, Taiwan's uh, electronic exports. That also remains a very robust number and because that's in August. So that's also 23%. Uh, so the momentum in electronics, especially in semiconductors, uh, continue to persist. Uh, the other thing is we'll discuss later on the CIFMED, the, the webinar that they had with us last week, and then uh, the Del Monte results that was also on, on Friday. Uh, our, our technical view in general has no change. I still we think a sideways movement because the macro is a bit fluid. But our medium term view, uh, we'll show some charts later. We are still positive on the market. And uh, macro wise, there, there are two reasons. We still think uh, global growth rates will still be elevated. Uh, the growth rates are definitely off the peak uh, because you cannot sustain at such a pace, I mean, year on year. Uh, but it remains elevated compared to the uh, pre pandemic levels. Uh, the other thing that is positive for global markets, at least the vaccination rates are, are progressing. We'll show you later. Uh, in terms of some of the key ones, I think on the 14th, which is basically tomorrow, the, I think there's going to be an Apple product launch, so everyone will be watching that, I guess. Uh, and the end of the end of this week, you're going to have a top girl results. Huh? Yeah. Uh, in terms of points webinar, uh, coincidentally, we have at least three, three webinars tomorrow. I mean, sometimes, uh, um, because this webinars is not in our control, sometimes it depends on slots and depends on where, when the corporate one is. So coincidentally, everybody wanted it on Tuesday. So there are going to be at least three events on, on Tuesday. Uh, I think H and HR Net will be the interesting one because uh, they don't do so many webinars and we have a buy call on it. The uh, following week, we have uh, Comfort and I think uh, Asian Pay TV. So if you have time, feel free to register at, uh, at the, the link there or through our Telegram chat group. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, we'll start off as, as usual. We just have a quick look at what's happening on the COVID cases globally. Uh, the number is positive. I think after two months of continuous rise, uh, we're beginning to see global cases start to roll over. So this is uh, positive, uh, at least from, the, from the, at least the, the lockdown situation, the trajectory of it. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, Singapore, um, uh, we all know there's a big spike underway. Uh, if you listen to the MTF, uh, what they're saying is that the, the Ministry Task Force meeting, uh, it started on the 24th and 
based on uh, experience in other countries, uh, these things could rise, like every week could double and it could be like 30 to 40 days before picking. So that's why they threw out, uh, again, it's just a, a scenario. It doesn't mean it will happen, but you could even hit as high as 3,000 if you don't kind of don't contain the situation. Um, and they also mentioned that, you know, everyone, the focus is on ICU bed capacity, the, the so-called 1,000 that we have. But the comfortable level is actually 300. So, uh, and, and the reason why the, they are they're still plan to reopen and, the, and living with the virus uh, view is still intact. But just like right now, the trajectory of, the, of this transmission wave is, is just too sharp. And they worry, you need to at least observe another one to two weeks to see how serious uh, these cases are, which is happening right now, and how it impacts ICU before they kind of reopen. So the good news is at least the reopening is still happening. I just said a bit of caution right now. Uh, I think you can see the numbers really hitting 80 overdoses. And the question was, why are we not reopening? But I think that's the reason. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, this is just a, a chart on what we mentioned earlier. So the blue line is the uh, is the, the reserves right now, which is, you can see on the left hand, uh, it's about 400, bi uh, 400 plus billion. Uh, you can't see the detail here, but the red line is just the cumulative. It's like the net inflows uh, on a 12-month basis. So it was, a I guess, not, not a coincidence, but when the pandemic hit in maybe February, March, that's when the reserves started to surge very sharply. Uh, I think we can only conclude that because the, maybe the Singapore's no safe haven status, so you can see all this liquidity start to surge. And though, uh, we, I mean, we're not economists. So the only conclusion I guess I can get is that yeah, it's going to be strong for the Sing dollar. The, the numbers on the there, you can just see the, the amount that was like inflow of 82 billion, uh, 60 billion. Whereas, you know, the past two, three years, we didn't even hit 40 billion. Highest was 33 in 2017. And the last two years pre pandemic was like flat. Uh, next slide. Uh, th this is this is um, this is this is the construction uh, data on you know, the 12 month, and that's why we still have a buy on building materials. You no, know, despite uh, like we mentioned in the previous week, the challenges faced by a typical contractor, but you no, know, we still like the raw ma the building materials like Pen United and BRC, and and the reason is that we are just playing the rebound here. You can see the chart uh, is the rebound, the recovery that's underway. Uh, I think I think the BCA is forecasting, I think, 30, 30 billion. I think pre-pandemic, we were running almost as high as 35 billion of uh, contracts awarded. Uh, so, so right now, it's about 20 billion. So we think that it can at least jump to 30 billion and for the next one, two years. And that's why we have uh, expo uh, buy calls on, on the two raw material, uh, sorry, uh, the two building material companies. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, this is just a refresh. Uh, these are the latest data points we got from electronics. So you can see that the global, con uh, global semiconductor sales continue to be very robust. Uh, it's surging about almost 30%, uh, the fastest growth rate in almost a decade. I, I guess the, the main difference now compared to you know, maybe 2010, 2008 is that the demand for semiconductor is not just from handphones and PCs and PCs and handphones. Now, now it's coming from everywhere, as you all know, from autos, gaming, um, cryptocurrency and everything. So that's why the, the cycle may be, uh, the volatility may not be so high, hopefully, because it's more broad-based and so forth. Um, the, the next one is just, uh, just on the uh, look on electronic exports because it's the latest data point. Um, so although it's, it's up, but we always like to, to monitor whether is this just a bounce off the weakness in, in 2020. But actually, even when we compare to 2019, uh, the, the growth rate is still very strong. I think compared to 2019, uh, the electronic exports continue to rise even uh, from 2019 onwards, onwards, even before the, the pandemic. Yeah. Likewise for semiconductor. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Yeah, sorry, I think it's a bit slow. Okay, anyway, uh, just to on a, our medium term outlook on a macro perspective, the two reasons why we are still positive. Uh, firstly, I know despite all the groom, especially in Singapore, we're not reopening. Uh, the vaccination globally is still underway. So the, the blue bar you see at the bottom is basically the global vaccination rate. So we should at least hit, 50, I mean, almost hopefully we can hit almost 50% global vaccination rate. Uh, and the positive is that in the developed markets, uh, countries, uh, although it's slowed down, you can see the orange line the, in the US, that's the US number, uh, sorry, that's the US number, which was climbing up the red line, sorry. 
it was up 17th. Then, you know, it started to start. I think the vaccination has slowed down in the US. But at this rate, uh, we think they can hit at least 70% and even Europe can hit 80% by this year. So this is positive. I think it just means that the reopening is on track and the, the economy should be able to reopen more and, and not go back into lockdowns as the vaccination continues. I mean, hopefully, of course, there's other things to think about. Yeah, next slide. Okay, the, the other positive is that uh, global growth rates, we think, uh, will still continue to, to improve. Uh, if you just look at the German and Japan industrial production, uh, uh, there are lots of macro. I mean, you can like, have 50 pages, but we just try to pick one that is the, the most relevant, hopefully. Uh, you can still see that although the chart looks like it's coming off, but you know, you're comparing against 20, uh, 2020 collapse. So that's why it looks. But even then, uh, the growth rates that we see is about 5 and 10%, which is still higher than pre-pandemic of 4%. So we still think uh, global growth will... The, de the demand is strong, I think. Uh, the issue now is just the supply constraints. I think you can see even in, in the US, sorry to digress, but the jobs, there's like almost 10 million, 10 million job openings. So demand in general is strong, but just that, of course, supply is the, the issue right now. Uh, the other thing is just that you can also see on the right-hand side is the imports of, of US. It's just a reflection of the vibrancy of global trade uh, and a lot of it is driven by the US. Uh, again, it, uh, you can't compare the 50%, you know, the red line that is collapsing, but it, because everything is peak, of course, you're comparing with 2020. But when we look at uh, the latest data point against 2019, which is at least you get a fairer uh, view on the growth rate, it's still growing about 10 to 20%. So the blue line is the value of imports from the US, which, you know, is helping uh, uh, the global trade and also the volume of containers that's moving through uh, the LA, which is the, the West Coast, you know, a lot of it is obviously from China exports. So it's just to show that global trade remains uh, vibrant, although the growth rates have peaked. So that's why in medium term, you're still positive on, on, on the market on a macro standpoint. Yeah. Next slide. Okay, uh, we'll just run through the film on the ground. Uh, for those who did not attend. So, so SIFMAN is an Australian company, uh, engineering and construction. Uh, I guess the issue for, uh, at least for me, is that this, uh, we're not very familiar with the construction activity. So that's why, uh, no, it's a bit uh, a bit alien for us, but this is a big company. They got 2,800 employees. A lot of the things they do is quite wide. They got earth work, concrete work, electric cabling, maintenance of you know, uh, uh, iron ore plants, you know, LNG plants. Uh, the results was good, uh, FY21, the earnings doubled and the Auburn book remains strong at almost one, uh, 1 billion. Uh, their customers is quite wide actually. If you look at the table on the right, they do work in, in Woodside, in the LNG, they do work in iron ore mines, lithium mines and so forth. They make a lot of maintenance work. Uh, and the, the fifth bullet point, uh, compared to maybe five, six years ago, I think what is new for them is they penetrated the defense market. Uh, so at their Henderson port, uh, they are doing this 10 offshore uh, offshore patrol boats, uh, not vessel, it's offshore patrol vessels contract. So right now they're working on the fourth and they got like six more to, to compete. So that's why this is a new growth area for them. Uh, the, in, they said there's almost a 50-year opportunity because Australia is going to build like, like uh, minor warship vessels. Uh, I'm not technically sure what that actually means, but it's more like the smaller warships, I guess. Um, and the other thing is the another new growth area for them is infrastructure, which is basically you know government government jobs, bridge and construction work, which they didn't do in the past or their presence. They were more of a like a so called subcontractor, and now they, they are bidding directly. So that's another new growth area for them. Uh, the rest will be in resource means they are you know, LNG plants. They do a lot of maintenance work, uh, which in layman terms you know they are shut because all these plants need to be shut down or maintain them, they'll be there, the ones to help on the shutting down and restarting and so forth. Uh, uh, and, and basically, they're just reinforcing that they have exposure to resource, exposure to government work, just to iron out. You know, sometimes resource, the demand may not be so strong, a bit volatile, so they, got, they are quite broad-based to iron out any volatility. Uh, the nearest competitor they mentioned was this company, which I'm not really sure, is like Model the first. Uh, I mean, it's a bigger company, but their, their PE is about 20 times. So this company is about 10 times. But again, the thing that, you know, for us, we're just not very familiar with, uh, with Australian construction activity. So it's hard for us to like, have a very strong view, at least from, from our point of view. Nick, next slide.
Okay, the next one is just uh, Del Monte's first quarter 22 results. Uh, if you look on, on, the, on the pictures on the, the, on, <clears throat> on the right side, so, excuse me, uh, it's just to show you their strength. I mean, so they, are, they have number one position in multiple products under Del Monte called like canned vegetables, canned food number two, fruit cup snacks, uh, canned tomato number three. This just, and at the bottom here, it's just their market share in Philippines. Of course, Philippines are dominant, like 90% market share, 80, you know, and so forth. This is just to, to show what how is their market share. Uh, so, so just to go back on the bullet points, uh, they, they are consumer products, mainly in the US and Philippines. Uh, the first quarter results uh, was a turnaround. Uh, this is the second quarter where they turn profitable. Uh, the pet the pet me or is about US 18 million, the turnaround from a 3 million loss last year. Uh, and or, or if you analyze the number, I mean, we don't cover, but if you just analyze it, they are, they are like almost eight times PE, uh, which is cheap. I mean, considering most consumer stocks are trading about you know, uh, mid-teens to even 20%. Uh, the, the, the issue for them is the interest burden. I mean, their interest is like a property <laughs> developer. It's like their interest is like US 26 million per quarter. I mean, so they are paying interest expense of 100 million. So that's huge. So if they actually can turn around the business and cash flows improve, so this could be another you know, a growth driver because they will kind of reduce their interest burden or you know, even refinance at lower interest rates because the operationally they are stronger. So in terms of why they turn around, uh, it's mainly a gross margin expansion for the US. So the US from four, four, 5 million loss, they, they made, uh, sorry, from 14 million loss, they made like 5 million. So this is like a 20 million turnaround in profit. In earnings, I'm sorry. Uh, and the, the reason why the margins jump up so much, uh, they raised prices in May. And they actually going to raise prices in September too. Uh, and interestingly, they said that uh, because of all this increase in raw materials, the impact is 60 million US if they don't do anything. Of it. That means they're going to lose six, they're going to have a loss of 60 million from higher, you know, higher raw material costs, shipping costs, and so forth. So one of the things to offset that is to at least raise prices. So I guess there's some inflation in the US. Uh, the second thing is, um, you know, uh, a bit of history. Uh, when Del Monte uh, Pacific, which is the Lisco here, bought Del Monte US in, I think, I think five years ago, or roughly, uh, it, it was owned by a PE firm. And the PE firm only focused on you no know, low margin. They just, and pet foods also, because they don't really care about canned food. Uh, they just became more like a, a manufacturer, don't really bother much about, the, uh, about branded products. Uh, and this become an outsourcing partner. But then when the new management came in, uh, they focused more on private label. So you can see, uh, that's why they have a lot more new products. Uh, so the margin expansion is that they kind of uh, reduce their reliance on all these outsourcing. You know, people ask them to manufacture private labels, which is very low margin. Uh, and then they started to launch a lot more products. You can see on the picture on the right, the Joba, bubble tea, the, the, the fruit snack, uh, and, and so forth. And, and that has also helped earning uh, revenue. So uh, new products, which is like those launched three years or less, um, the past three years, uh, is, accounts for 5% of the revenue, which is huge because they only grew like 11. So half the growth comes from new products. Uh, the second thing of the turnaround is the profit in Philippines shot up, uh, but that's mainly because of the international sales. So they sell a lot of fresh pineapple to China, which is high margin because you don't have to do anything, right? Just, just pack and ship out. Uh, and uh, so the out, in terms of the outlook, uh, again, we don't cover, but it's just our view. Uh, the momentum from US is still strong because you know when you have new products, the momentum should continue. Uh, and, and also they're penetrating into more sales channels. Uh, of course, they're also raising prices. Uh, sales channel means they're going to convenience store, fast food, which they didn't emphasize much in the past until the new management came in. And of course, from Philippines, it's the only I mean, ninety percent share. I mean, what else can you get, right? So it's more like just growing the market. They're expanding into dairy, snacks, and other culinary. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. Yeah, sorry, everyone. I'm not sure the technical. Why it's a bit slow? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we go through the last two slides just on our our more our model portfolio, the performance. Uh, this is the August performance. Um. Uh, and we were down about 1.6, the, the table on the right at the bottom. Uh, STI was down around 3.5%. The table on the right is just to show how we compare. Uh, I think we, we are still you know, trying to reel back performance from the 6% the loss in February because of uh, the, you know, the, the collapse in Yoma, which was in our model portfolio. Uh, so last month, the one that killed us was 
and I'm not sure if this is due to bonus issue, but maybe it's just the price because I took it from Bloomberg. Uh, what happened was some rebound in Thai beverage and Asian pay TV. Again, this is just for your reference. Uh, uh, next slide. Okay, well, I'm just taking long. Uh, okay, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, this is just to... Uh, I think, uh, sorry, we should have done this last week, but just that there were quite a lot of things to, to discuss last week. So this is just, uh, re, um, just to have a look at how what were the stocks that did well in August last month and what didn't. So last month, the gainers were, were a lot of the growth stocks, surprisingly. It's like Franken, Yang Tzu Chiang, um, and UMS and so forth. The losers was Nano. I think we all know what happened there. Uh, the, the company's results were disappointing. And the, and the one that the dragged down the STI, the 3% was uh, SGX and a lot of the conglomerates uh, that Jardine and Sam caught. Uh, yeah, if you look on the table on the left, it's just a, to show you uh, which sectors didn't do well and which sectors did well. So the one that pulled down was conglomerates. Uh, like we mentioned, Jardine. Uh, what pulled down last month was the banks. Mini OCBC, I think OCBC dropped 7% last month. Uh, DBS was held up that the, and the one that did well last month was shipping up 14, all because of Yang Chechang, because Yang shipping is mainly uh, Yang Chechang. Okay, uh, I think that's my last slide. Uh, uh, again, uh, we'll have more corporate uh, discussions to, uh, next week. Uh, this week was just a bit slow. We just did more macro. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone. 